Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, March 16, 2023. It's about three o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast of the United States. I have been waiting for this segment for the past 48 hours since we learned of the confrontation between two uh, Russian fighter jets and an American uh, spy drone over the Black Sea earlier this week. Who better? to talk about this and all things related to it than Scott Ritter, who joins us now. Scott, welcome back to the show, as always. Uh, what what happened? I mean, you, you wrote a piece about this, which is the best I have seen anywhere from any source in the past 48 hours. Obviously, I don't see classified things, but I devour this stuff. What happened over the Black Sea earlier this week? Well, the United States was carrying out what it claims to be a um, freedom of navigation uh, type exercise uh, using the, the drone uh, flying what they claim to be international airspace. Um, the problem is the international airspace that they claim to be flying in um, is adjacent to the Crimean Peninsula, one of the most sensitive military uh, locations for Russia at any time, and especially so now that Russia is engaged in a war with Ukraine, where the Crimean Peninsula figures heavily. Um, one of the things that nations can do during times of conflict like this or crisis is to declare exclusionary zones. So normally you have a 12 nautical mile extension of your, you know, your, your territorial limit. Um, but what you can do is say, we're going to extend that for a period of time um, because of special national security reasons. We do it, other nations do it, and Russia has done it. Uh, basically telling the United States, don't bother flying your drone uh, through this space or any aircraft through, through, through this space. Um, well, we opted to fly our drone through that space because we claim that Crimea doesn't belong to Russia. It belongs to Ukraine. And therefore, the territorial extension out of Korea, uh, Ukraine belongs to Ukraine. And Russia doesn't get to impose uh, its own exclusionary zone on that. You know, So we're playing semantic games. And on the surface of that, you, you know, the Russians may not, in and of itself, on that, uh, choose to create a conflict. We know the British tried this with a ship back in the summer of 19, uh, 2021. I remember they sailed a destroyer right along the same path that the, that the Reaper was on. Uh, at that time, the Russians fired warning shots. And when it was done, they told the British, if you ever sail here again, we'll sink the ship. No questions asked. We won't put up with it. Well, the British stopped sinking ships or sending ships. We sent the drone and Russia gave us instructions get out of here. 19 times they flew by it. 19 times. If you don't get the hint by the 19th time, uh, then Russia gets to do things like dump fuel on the drone to break up its aerodynamics and bring it down. They didn't shoot it down, but they brought it down. But here's the question. Why? Was this just about a diplomatic spat? No. You see, the United States is in the business of using intelligence information collected on Russia, giving it to the Ukraine so the Ukrainians can carry out attacks against Russia. So we are an active participant to the conflict. So the notion that we can come in and claim some sort of, you know, international uh, freedom of navigation status, that we are purely an innocent party is absurd in the extreme. We collect intelligence on the left wing of that drone was one of the most sophisticated signals intelligence collection platforms available for that drone. It was actively collecting intelligence on uh, you know against Russia to give to the Ukrainians so the Ukrainians could use it for war. We were a legitimate target of war. Russia should have shot us down out of the sky. The fact that they didn't means that Russia's in the business of escalation management, not trying to make this a big deal. But it is a big deal because the intelligence we provide to Ukrainians results in dead Russians and destroyed Russian equipment. Did uh, did uh, the Americans? Um I'm going to use a phrase that may not be correct, turn off a transponder or turn something off on the drone so as to make it more stealthy and, and less observable. I've heard that, but it makes no sense. First of all, this drone was flying in an altitude that is imminently detectable. It's flying through airspace that the Russians are monitoring every aspect of it. It was picked up when the moment it took off and uh, the moment it came in. They might have turned the transponder off for this reason. There are people out there who uh, call themselves the OSINT, the Open Source Intelligence Community. These are a bunch of uh, non-military, non-governmental people who monitor um, stuff. In the, and there's a lot of people who put out flight paths. So they'll sit there and say, we monitored the drone as it did this. We monitored this. And they'll, and they'll show aircraft flying. 
we may have turned off the transponder, not to fool the Russians, but to fool them so that we can tell a story about where the drone was flying that can't be verified by somebody. Because if OSINT people had this transponder, they would show exactly the flight path and any logical person looking at that would say, man, if that was an American, a uh, Russian drone flying that close to an American space during a time of war, collecting information on America to give it to people trying to kill Americans, we'd have shot it down too. Let me make sure that I understand uh, what you're saying. Uh, Russia and Ukraine are at war. The United States and NATO are backing up Ukraine with cash, with military equipment, and secretly uh, with human beings uh, on the ground. The drone was engaged in an act of war by spying on the most sensitive aspects of Russians of Russia's uh, military uh, um, gathering of human beings and of equipment uh, anywhere in Russia. The drone was a legitimate target of war, intentionally sent into the theater of war by American military authorities. Is is all of that true? Absolutely. Here's what. Can't say this with straight face. Here's what Senator Lindsey Graham would have done if he were the president of the United States. Well, we should hold him accountable and say that if you ever get near another uh, U.S. set flying in international waters, your airplane would be shot down. What would Ronald Reagan do right now? He would he would start shooting Russian planes down if they were threatening our assets. I can't imagine that Ronald Reagan or any American president in his right mind would kill Russian pilots because they came too close to a, a, an American drone in an area of airspace that Russia has claimed hands off on because of its sensitivity to what's going on on the ground. Yeah, Lindsey Graham doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be polite on your show, Judge, out of respect for you. Correct. And I'm not going to call him what he deserves isn't to be called. He, isn't he a general? in the Air Force Reserve, and he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about? Well, I think he's a colonel, um, and he's a, a lawyer. Um, so there we are. But the, the fact is, you know, unlike Lindsey Graham, well, I can say he served, but he, he doesn't know what he's talking about. During the Cold War, during the time of Ronald Reagan, we flew the most sensitive reconnaissance missions all along the periphery of the Soviet Union. And on numerous occasions, uh, the Soviets challenged us. Uh, you know, what would Ronald Reagan do? Hey. Graham, Lindsey Graham, how about the USS Caron in the, in the Black Sea, 1988, and an American cruiser um, was coming too close to Crimean Peninsula. Imagine that. And what did the Russians do? They sent a ship out that ramped it to knock it off course, made physical contact. What are you going to do, Lindsey? Sink the Russian Navy? You idiot. No, this is what big boys do. You see, big boys play big boy games, and they understand the consequences of the big boy game. We pushed it too far. The Russians took down the drone. Big boys back off and go, lesson learned. Lindsey Graham, a little boy, uh, is, wants to play tough guy. It ain't going to be him in the cockpit of the American aircraft. And I'll also tell you this, Lindsey, you don't have enough airplanes to put up and shoot down two Russian airplanes next to Crimea because they got an air defense system that includes the S-400 missile. they shoot down everything you're bringing in at it. And what are you going to do now? Bomb the air defense systems? Then they bomb your airfields. Then what, Lindsey? We got a nuclear war. Is that what you want, Lindsey Graham? Everybody listening to Lindsey Graham should dismiss him immediately as a dilettante, an idiot, and a warmonger who only wants to get America in trouble. And if you take a look at his face, you'll understand. He's not going to be the one who's paying the price. Here's He's his, the one that the uh, here's his uh, colleague and a fellow a neocon, Senator Marco Rubio. I think our response should be to fly more of these in that area and to potentially uh, have them escorted by U.S. fighter jets who are manned and have the capability to respond. These are, these are unarmed platforms. They're generally out there for reconnaissance, to see what's happening in the ocean, to have a situational awareness of what's going on in the area, totally according to international law. And so yeah. I think we should fly more of them. We shouldn't stop flying them. And in many cases, we should be prepared to scramble jets and respond if they are threatened by Russian aircraft. Again, the dumbest man in the world. Does he not understand, Marco, who's never served in the military? You want to fly, you want to take American military aircraft and fly them escorting a drone. Do you understand that the only advantages we have in air to air combat is long distance engagement? You see, we don't do dogfights anymore, Marco. It doesn't work that way. 
We take off and at a long distance with AWACS aircraft vectoring us in, we fire missiles to engage them in a long distance. You want to take all that advantage away, come up close next to their battle space where their air defenses will shoot you down. Their aircraft don't have to come close. They'll shoot you long distance. You're an idiot. He doesn't know anything about war and he doesn't know anything about international law. Um, Pro hint, Marco, when you fly an intelligence asset collecting intelligence on one target and you provide that intelligence to the other side to kill that other target, you're a participant in the conflict. You lose all the protections you have. You should be thankful the Russians aren't shooting down everything we got. What is the, uh, you know, if I were a guest on the show instead of the host, I'd be going, you go, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, 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 man. You you be yourself and the audience loves it because they don't get this from uh from anywhere else and mainstream media is filled with the uh, Lindsey Grahams and the Marco Rubios of the world who don't know what the blank uh they're uh they're talking about. What is the status of uh the uh, affairs on the ground in Ukraine? Are, are we at a stalemate? Is Bakhmut uh, about to fall? Are the Russian troops amassing, waiting for the earth to dry so they can come in in enormous numbers? What do your sources and your observations tell you, Scott? Every day this uh, this this battle for Bakhmut goes on, the Ukrainians are suffering close to a thousand dead a day. Um, mm -hmm. So this isn't a stalemate. And, this and is the Russians slaughter. and the Russians, yeah, like maybe eighty, a hundred. Um, okay. It's still a lot. I'm not trying to minimize it. They're suffering right. casualties. Those are casualties that would break the heart of America. Remember, we lost 200 guys a week in Vietnam, and we freaked out as a nation. The Russians are losing 80, 100 guys a day. Um, that's that's a heavy casualty, but it's not what the Ukrainians are losing, which are lo they're suffering overwhelming casualties and their equipment. Um, the Ukrainians are on the you know they're they're on the cusp of the breaking point, and that will be reached sooner rather than later. I can't sit here and say Bakhmut will fall tomorrow, fall in a week. Bakhmut will fall. We know that. And when it does fall, it will open up the Ukrainian front like, you know, like a can that bursts. And um, as President Zelensky has said, if Bakhmut falls, all of the Donbass falls. It opens up the entire Donbass region for the Russians to move in and take it. That's why the Ukrainians are fighting so hard for it. They are fighting hard. Let there be no doubt about this. This is not an easy fight. So th this is not a symbolic victory or an emotional victory or a victory. This is not a symbolic fight or an emotional fight or a fight for morale. This is a substantive fight, which when lost by the Ukrainians will have a substantive and material effect on Russia's march westward. Agreed? Agreed. This okay. is serious. This, look, you can't predict the future. Uh, and we don't know how this war is going to, I mean, I, I think I have an idea. I, I've been very forceful in saying, and I'll say it again, this war ends end of summer, early uh, early October. Uh, this, you know, Ukraine can't win this war. Um, and with that assessment in mind, this battle for Bakhmut, what has been taking place since May, but especially since the last couple of months, will go down in the history of this conflict as the critical battle of the war. This is the one that where the Ukrainians burned up their strategic reserves, the Russians were able to initiate the beginning of the collapse of the Ukrainian army. This is the battle that will go down as the Kursk. Uh, you know, Kursk was a key battle during World War II on the Eastern Front. This will go down as the Gettysburg for Americans. Understand that. Gettysburg was the turning point in the American Civil War. Bakhmut is the turning point in this conflict. Uh, the uh, Poles have agreed to send four, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is the first time any Western country is doing this, uh, fighter jets to Ukraine. So a couple of questions. Will these be manned by uh, Polish uh, pilots or by Ukrainian pilots? Uh, is this a, a game changer? Is it significant? Uh, is it a breakthrough for President Zelensky, who's been begging for air power for months? Well, the Ukrainians lose around four MiG-29s a week. Um, oh, these, are, these are Russian planes? Yeah. What is, does that mean they were left over from when the, the old Soviet Union days or that they were captured from the Russians? No, these were these were Soviet MiG-29s that the Polish Air Force um, had uh, acquired. And uh, so they're old aircraft that date back to the Cold War. They've been refurbished, modernized a little bit, but they're old aircraft. Um, they're maintenance nightmares. 
uh, you know, and, you know, the Ukrainians do have pilots uh, that can fly them, so they don't have to be Polish pilots, although depending on the avionics in it, you know, if this, even though it's a MiG-29 airframe, if the Poles have upgraded the avionics, a Ukrainian pilot may not be familiar with those, so hopefully they've been getting some sort of cross-training and familiarization. Um, how they're going to get the aircraft from Poland to Ukraine is an interesting thing, because if it takes off from a Polish airfield, flies into Ukraine, Poland just uh, became a participant in the conflict. So they're going to have to somehow tow the airplane across, uh, the line, et, et cetera. But four, four will accomplish nothing. They will be shot down. Uh, they probably, if the Russians you know, can detect them, they might be destroyed on the airfield before they ever get a chance to take off. Uh, this is not a game changer. It's a political stunt. What do these things cost? Well, again, because they were produced, you know, back in the, you know, the 1980s, um, you know, they, they, you can't compare, you know, uh, let's put it this way, an SU-27 of the kind that took down our $32 million drone cost the Russians around $30 million. This MiG-29, when it was built, probably runs in the area of $12 million. With upgrades, you could probably take it up to $15 million. So four airplanes, you're probably looking at around $60 million worth of uh, stuff. But then again, there has to be spare parts. There has to, I mean, right. this is not as easy as people are like, well, why don't we just give them four airplanes? Because they're four logistical nightmares. Uh, earlier uh, today, when uh, interrogating uh, Jack Devine, I got him to acknowledge, I don't take credit for this because he, he just says what he wants to say. Uh, he, now he acknowledged that an American goal in all of this is to drive Putin from office by weakening uh, the military, uh, causing a defeat, and then causing uh, the people in Russia that can pull the levers of powers to power to say enough is enough, it's time for you to go. I, I After he said that, I countered with, and suppose he's replaced by his successor, Dmitry Medvedev, who has called for an invasion of Poland. Uh, this was Jack's response to that. He fails. Why? Because he didn't bomb enough houses? Because he didn't kill enough people? That he didn't put his best? No. The next person isn't going to have new armies. So the next person is doomed to fail. I'm working on when Putin goes, they're going to sit around the table. Hey, enough of this stuff. Let's let's get an air gap. So I do not okay. think they can't be more hostile. There's no more hostile play. It's not like Putin's laying back and being uh, nice to us. Does he know what he's talking about? No. First of all, any anybody who thinks that... Um, we're going to succeed in removing Vladimir Putin from office, doesn't know Putin, doesn't know Russia, doesn't know anything. Uh, and I hate to say that about Jack Devine because clearly he's a man who served his country honorably in a very difficult uh, role. Uh, but, you know, no, <laughs> the Russians just, again, as NATO basically bleeds out, I mean, all of its equipment to, uh, to, to, to Ukraine. And understand, the United States military has come out, put an additional budget requirement in, $300 million dollars is what $300 billion, I'm sorry, is what it's going to cost to replace the equipment that we sent to um, to Ukraine. $300 billion. So we sent... Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. wait we, we, Joe Biden has a blank check for $113 billion. It's going to cost us three times that to replace the equipment that he's given to President Zelensky? Yeah. Yeah. That's... that's just, we, we, I'm not making the number up. The Pentagon said that. So... You know, that's the case. So meanwhile, we're going to go bankrupt trying to get back to you know, the status quo. Does Jack Devine understand that Russia has expanded its military from 900,000 to 1.5 million? Uh, these will be professional troops that Russia's defense industry is working overtime to build the equipment uh, to do this. I don't think Jack Devine knows anything about Russia. I don't mean to be disrespectful to the man, but clearly what he's saying, he doesn't, doesn't understand the, the Russian military, he doesn't understand the Russian defense industry, he doesn't understand Russian politics, he doesn't understand Vladimir Putin. Putin's not going anywhere. He's more firmly entrenched today with the broadest base of support of the Russian people. And unlike the United States, name the last Russian bank to fail. You can't. Okay. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road. They just built a, a new, a new subway. This is all connected. The federal government wasting and blowing money and then yeah. deciding who it's going to bail out and who it's not going to bail out, picking winners and, and losers. For, from my perspective, there's there's one guiding principle in all of this. What will help old Joe get reelected? That seems to be the guiding principle 
of this federal government. If he'll help him to get reelected to be a wartime president like his heroes, Abraham Lincoln and FDR, he'll make sure we're in war. If he'll help him get reelected to bail out the depositors at a bank over and above what the federal insurance is, but not the investors in the bank, he'll bail out the depositors. If it will help him to get reelected to bail out the investors, he'll bail out the investors. There's no rhyme or wrong. There's no uh, there's no no constitutional principle here. It, it's what will help uh, old Joe. Here's um, Jack describing President Putin. Actually, before we get to that, President Putin said something earlier this week that made me think of you. We also thought of Jack, and I thought of Colonel McGregor. President said, Germany is still under occupation. He was tweaking and mocking Chancellor Schulz for the sheep-like, lapdog-like way in which he permitted the United States of America to invade his country by destroying the pipeline, as if the U.S. were still occupying West Germany as it did after World War II. And when I heard President Putin say that, I never thought I would applaud something he said, but I applauded it because it was morally correct, it was historically analysis, and it was true. Look, the United States acts as if Germany's not a sovereign state. It's not just the bombing of Nord Stream. Do you recall under the Obama administration that we, the National Security Agency was listening to the personal cell phone conversations of Angela Merkel? Um, yes. You know, we have military bases. Do you remember Donald Rumsfeld mocking the Germans in the lead up to the Iraq war, calling them old Europe? Um, we, we wanted to turn Germany into a lily pad uh, where we would just assume our ability to go in and use military space in Germany to carry out our adventures in the Middle East. Um, well, legally speaking, Germany isn't occupied, you know, in the aftermath. Practically and functionally and psychologically, it's very much an occupied country. And Vladimir Putin is right on all counts. Um, here, here's um, uh, Jack on how dark and how evil Vladimir Putin is. Is Putin evil? Yeah, I think he, he fits into that category. When you kill the way the deaths that are mounting in Ukraine and you're not remorseful about it, it puts you in a new category. So okay. I think he's dangerous. And the second thing about him is I thought, you know, he was more political than, than I, 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 I've taken, you know, I was tough on him, but I will take him down a few more notches on the big things that I thought were important and that we needed to have an accommodation with Russia and there was room. There was no room. He has a different mindset and it's much more black and darker than I thought. And I think it makes this problem more formidable. Evil, black and dark whereas he's actually moderate. Well, that's just that. I mean, with all due respect to Jack, um, the United States killed more people invading Iraq in 2003 than Russia has killed, uh, and I'm talking about civilians, and Russia's killed in Ukraine in a year. Um, you know, the Russians have been very, 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 very soft touch with the civilian population of, of Ukraine. Um, I just remind people, when we liberated Normandy, we killed 60,000 French civilians, 60,000. Uh, you know, Russia's killed, and I say Russia, 12,000 civilians have died uh, in this conflict. Many of them died because the Ukrainians are shelling their own people. Many of them died because the Ukrainians are using civilians as a human shield, which is a war crime in itself. Jack Devine doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know who Vladimir Putin is. I, I would challenge you to, uh, to have Jack come up and tell me how many speeches of Putin he's listened to, how many conferences where Putin is talking to. Um, <laughs> Here's the, uh, Maverick. Uh, how many conferences you know that that, he, that is observed? I, my guess is that Jack Devine hasn't uh, doesn't follow Vladimir Putin and is not aware of Vladimir Putin and shouldn't be talking about Vladimir Putin. Scott, we're going to set up that debate with you and Jack. Maybe uh, Maverick can moderate it with me. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but you uh, you. Put well, he he was supposed to be locked up in the bedroom. I don't know how he got out. I'm I'm oh, going to oh, investigate that, that issue. That's <laughs> You should be worried about. Jack, <laughs> yeah, Devine would say, Jack Devine would say, Vladimir Putin let him out. Uh, Putin let him. Putin did it. Putin yeah. did it. <laughs> uh, can't thank you enough uh, for all your time with us, my dear friend. All the best. Well, thank you. Whew. Boy, if you like what you just saw, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe 
on judging freedom. More as we get it. More Colonel McGregor, more Scott Ritter, eh, maybe a little more, more Maverick. Right. And more <laughs> Maverick. Judge Napolitano for judging freedom.